Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Enoch, and uh, I think we are far behind time. Uh, we know which math time will be quick and snappy. Uh, just here to tell you about uh, Geo and Python. Uh, there have been a lot of talks, but uh, I seem not to find um, a lot of them in relation to Geo. So I decided to put in this call and uh, this presentation. It was accepted, and I'm here to say something. But before we get started, uh, first of all, um, I wouldn't call it a disclaimer. Uh, I'm neither uh, an expert in these two fields, but I still do something with them every day as part of uh, my workflow and what I do. Might not be convincing enough, um, but I'm trying. I will try to convince you. Uh, and then uh, finally, if you take a deep dive, uh, the title says a shallow dive, but if you take a deep dive, um, I'm sorry, there's no lifeguard on duty. So basically, we'll be looking at um, GI's basics, um, OSGEO, and um, some uh, Python projects that uh, connect to geospatial. Now, why is this uh, really important? It's important because everything that happens in this world happens somewhere. Uh, the link over there is to a YouTube video uh, by the UN, which I think when, when you watch it, you can actually attest to the fact that everything that we do um, has the location component. And um, not related, uh, snakes actually understand geography. They leave traces around. And it's like now we are snakes in the digital world. Whatever we do, we are leaving the location traces. Everyone checks in on Facebook, uh, do Instagram, and the other stuff. Your yeah, location is uh, being recorded. Now, basically, what is GIS? Uh, GIS is a system uh, made of uh, both hardware, software, and uh, the users, the humans. Uh, we use uh, maps, or we interact with a certain level of applications that have uh, maps in them. Maps uh, are the end product, or just a small part of the GIS world. Um, it's um, geographic information systems. GIS also have um, data types. And uh, if you want to get started with uh, developing applications or doing something with GeoDev, you need to understand the concept of what this is really about. If you're writing an application for a bank, you need to know how the workflow is. So uh, we have uh, two data types, that is vector and raster. Um, the vector data simply represent uh, all you query. That is what you can search for. That's what is in the database. If you're searching for a Bank of Ghana auditorium, you search on um, Google Maps or any other map application you use, it's the vector data that is being queried. And it's in uh, three forms. It's either point, line, or polygon. Points, we see all over, lines representing continuous features, such as roads, streams, um, etc. Polygons, buildings, football field, swimming pool, what have you. And um, this vector data is in uh, several formats. They are open, some are proprietary. Uh, we have GeoPackage, which is highly open. Um, GeoJSON, which some of us might have used before if you are a developer or uh, you have played with some uh, GeoStars before. And PostGIS, which is an extension to uh, the Postgres database, uh, allows you to do really advanced cool stuff. Uh, sometimes you can't uh, even do with ease in uh, GI systems. And then shapefiles. I put shapefiles as a small. Um, item because uh, shapefile is actually not a one file or one, uh, one data type. It's several files. Um, it's kind of bloated. If you miss one file, uh, you have issues. But it's one of the most used formats um, outside there. If you're requesting a geodata, you'll find it in a shapefile mostly. Yeah, raster is the picture you see. The picture you see, the satellite image, the autophoto, the TIFF, the DMs, what have you. So this is raster. The raster enables us to generate vector data because you can see the alignment and the other steps. Now, you also need to understand the coordinate reference system. Uh, this will not go much, you know, I will not say much, but this is just to tell you that the Earth is not uh, flat or maybe just plain like that, that we have x, y. We have latitude along it, but it's not necessarily the case mostly. So you can't use the latitude and longitude for Ghana here in a, a different projection. Projection just like um, we have a scale. I mean, Ghana here, my projection is kind of different from somewhere in the US. If I pick a coordinate here and I use it in a different projection, which belongs to the US, 
it will not actually put that point or that location exactly where I am. One common one that is used there, uh, and we all use it mostly is, uh, by the sat nav, the GPS receivers. That's WGS84, and that's long we see every day. That's how come if you travel along, you don't have to reproject your staffs. It puts you on the map automatically. So this is one thing that um, is confusing sometimes, but you need to get your hands off it um, as you start doing geo development because data you have to project present needs to be in a certain uh, coordinate reference system. Now, why the need for um, geospatial development tax and all this stuff? There are several questions that could be answered from uh, geo analysis. Um, basic buffer, say how many people could be affected in, in the flooding. If we have a drain, a very big drain, and then uh, it's overflowing. How many people will be affected in a um, five meter radius? You can actually do this stuff and then uh, in a GI system. And it gives you that idea, it gives you the perspective, the picture, the visual representative of what is missing here, what is not there, and what can be done. And uh, several analysis you could do, accessibility, connectivity, and um, many more. Yeah, so if you are getting started or you are doing geo development, one issue that you might come um, across is data. Data is really, really uh, an issue. Mm, let me say on our side of the continent because uh, government is the biggest or the largest producer of um, data. Uh, you can't uh, doubt that fact. And then uh, most um, institutions um, think this is a personal property sometimes and it's locked up. You need data for some time, uh, something you have to go knock in several uh, this and stuff before you get it. But it's a major uh, producer of data. We have private, and then uh, we have the crowd. And it turns out the crowd uh, seems to work uh, faster and uh, better um, in our area over here. So I will take uh, the time to talk about uh, one great uh, project called uh, OpenStreetMap, where um, if you want to try something and you don't have uh, data from anywhere, you play around. A quick um, source to go to for data is uh, OpenStreetMap. Um, it's online, offline, and um, it's open data. It's under open database uh, common license. And uh, at the base level, all data in OpenStreetMap is um, XML stored in a post-GIS database, and you can access osm.org. Yeah, it's a map of the world, and um, trying to people trying to map the whole world from scratch, um, no copying, because uh, all other maps uh, you see have uh, copyright. Google Maps. It's free as in uh, free beer, but not as in freedom. So you can use it here, yeah, move around, but you can't get the nitty gritty. What is in the database? You can't actually extract it. For me or someone who is a geographer or geologist want to do something with uh, his or her GI system, can't actually reuse data coming from Google. Uh, OpenStreet might be used by many. I use it every day, every second. Uh, Facebook is one big user. Uh, Uber uses it as well. Um, humanitarian purposes is the map that we call Save Lives because uh, for disaster risk management, uh, the first re respondents need just basic data. And when there's an earthquake, all you need as a, a respondent is which roads are disconnected. You, you don't care if uh, there are plating, but roads are disconnected, basic stuff. So even two roads on the map is better than none for a Red Cross or USAID or any respondent uh, coming in. Yeah, you can try OpenStreetMap yourself offline. Um, my favorite application is the first one, OSM Ant, um, telling you that you can download the whole database because it's uh, open data. Yeah, things are organized as features, what have you, whatever that is permanent and physical can be mapped in this database and you can also extract it. Um, like I said in the beginning, it's XML at the base level. So whatever you save is key value pairs with uh, dates and timestamp. Now, um, you as a developer, you would like to maybe query this database, extract data from it. The Swiss Army knife to the whole database is called the Overpass API. This API is uh, really interesting. Uh, you can really use it in your tools, embed it, do whatever. This here is just basically um, um, searching for all schools. So all schools in Ghana will be amenity school. And then uh, as at, I think I ran this around um, 12, 12 a.m. this dawn and um, I had 1,004 staff. That, this is basically on nodes, points. There might be schools on polygons. 
not uh, lines, because lines can represent that. Uh, so points, um, this is what it's telling me. And uh, you can do several stuff. There are libraries to do connectivity, see a graph network. This is um, a quick graph network of roads around University of Ghana. And um, we just some train line of course, and uh, with the uh, OSMNX library, I could just um, do this quickly. Uh, just uh, OpenStreetMap in Africa is a community, just like how we have Python community, Wikimedia, and uh, what have you. Um, several projects going on in our Africa and across. And uh, this year, there is also going to be state of the map, like we have PyCon, um, Africa in Cote d'Ivoire just here. So you can check it out and see what you can grab from it. Uh, data reuse, because it's open data, it can be reused several times. Uh, uh, just uh, last week, this application was open source. That's how come I'm adding it to my slide. It's called trotro.app. Uh, this data was generated into OpenStreetMap. We use the OSM to GTFS to convert. GTFS is a standard for uh, transit data. So when you're searching for where is the next bus arriving in Europe or using a train or Google Maps to query transit stuff, the data is in GTFS. So with this tool, it's Python 3. We're able to transform uh, this data into GTFS and it's using the app. You can also go grab it, try something innovative with it, and let's make our lives better. Now, GS application exists. Um, you can't do all from uh, the terminal because it might not be friendly from you, for you to program this, this in the beginning. So yeah, well, we have open source and proprietary one. S3 is a big player in the proprietary industry. Um, OSGO, the Open Source Geo uh, Special Foundation, um, has QGIS. And QGIS is uh, one tool that loves Python at its core. The QGIS has an API that is built on top of uh, Python. So you can see an, uh, a Python console directly in the QGIS interface. Um, QGIS also has uh, plugins that are, I would say, 80% of the plugins that extend the functionality of QGIS are built with uh, Python. And uh, when I was just writing these slides, I looked on Twitter and then quickly I saw something. This is over 2,000 DEMs, digital elevation models by someone. He's trying to process them in QGIS. And guess what? He's using a, just, just three lines of Python code to actually support some other stuff he's doing. Telling you that uh, it's not any big stuff you have to do, but understanding the basics, identifying the field in which you want to use GI development and uh, implementing it. Uh, GeoNode is one interesting project. It's a CMS for geospatial data. You might want to create a portal for geospatial data, but databases uh, such as MySQL might not be able to handle uh, geo elements with that kind of uh, geometry they have. So GeoNode is uh, interesting, built on top of Django, uh, which you will have. Uh, it has a geo server at the back end and some other stuff. Uh, it has been deployed around the world, so you can also take a look and see how this could serve um, in your your work. Yeah, there are some other libraries. There are a lot of them. We can look at all of them. This is meant to be a, uh, an appetizing talk, talk to motivate you and inspire you to see what you are missing from the geo side, and you can dive into it. There are several of them. And in uh, Python, there is a PyProj, which manages a CRS. That is coordinate reference system. So you don't need to always go have to search for coordinate reference or try to control them yourself. But with this, uh, you can handle projections and other stuff. Yeah, so in basically in conclusion, GIS is fun. Um, there is more than just uh, writing codes to it because what you are doing goes directly to affect something which is physical. All the stuff you are seeing are uh, location-based. Um, many Python libraries, I said, Python loves Geo and is vice versa. And um, geo data science, yeah, there is data science. We do, a lot of people are doing data science. But add that geospatial component to it and see the beauty it brings. Um, there is the location component to all the data being collected. If it does not exist, you can. And uh, I don't know if uh, maybe Python is taking over uh, because there are a lot of stuff you could actually do in a GI system that you could still run from uh, a Python, such as uh, maybe clipping, and basic GIS analysis. And uh, get out there, try something. You can collect GPS points yourself. Try to visualize how you move from uh, 
home to work. All these data, you can actually collect them yourself, play around it and see. It's no rocket science, absolutely. And uh, just to conclude, um, all these staffs are built around communities. Without communities, we will not be here today to um, celebrate this community as uh, PyCon Africa. So there are several of them, Wikimania, PyCon, State of the Mark, Force 4G. Um, in Accra here, we have a user group for Linus. Uh, and then uh, we meet every Saturday though. Tomorrow we'll be meeting and then, uh, so what I basically want to say is, if you are a developer or you do something in your small corner, um, just try to connect to the community, share what you know, and then learn from others as well. Because it's a community of practice, we learn from each other and then the community grows. Um, thank you. Yep, nice. this, this, uh, there's, there's time for some questions. Good. Uh, I actually have the other mic. So, um, yeah. Thank you. All right, my name is Michael. Um, it's a very good one. Uh, actually, I really uh, understand what, um, I really share a certain sentiment with you because I actually got into Python uh, because of um, geospatial analysis. Oh, and then, um, well, I'm a geologist, I did head science, and I'm doing a postgrad in um, geoinformation science. Oh, and then one thing, one problem we find most is um, data. Because um, I think the first keynote we had, when Mustafa came to speak with us, I really had an issue of that sort, where we have a lot of data, but the data is not, just, um, it's not geographically referenced. So we can't use the data for geospatial analysis. You could just visualize it, but you can't tie them to particular areas. You may mention of um, open source uh, uh, applications where we can get this geographic data from. Um, how, I want to know how the contribution is. I mean, how the data gets into it, how do they validate the data that they get and stuff. Okay. Can I tackle it straightforward? Or? All right, so uh, I was talking specifically about OpenStreetMap. Now, talking about accuracy-wise, uh, in relation to what is on the ground, everyone is wrong. What shows that this is Bank of Ghana Auditorium? You might see it on Google Maps or any other maps, but what shows is Bank of Ghana Auditorium? Unless you come here and it doesn't exist before you know that this doesn't exist. So talking about accuracy, OpenStreetMap is a crowdsource project, crowdsource movement. The whole database is built on the wiki style, like Wikipedia. On Wikipedia, you know everybody can contribute. Even if you don't have an account, you can contribute. But whatever you do is stored. There's history about it. You can see the history of it. So in OpenStreetMap, every single point you add, there's history about it. So you have that flexibility to add something if you're a newcomer. And then you mess it up still. There is somebody who actually see at one point in a time, fix it, send you a message, guide you in order to become a, a better person because it's a community of practice. Some people started very badly, but at the point in time, they got mentored, they found out that this is how to do it. Not that the person didn't know how to do it, but in the beginning, it was not obvious that this is how to do it. So yeah, OpenStreetMap is one platform. It's a community very big than myself here. And, uh, the data gets in there through volunteers. It's a volunteer, volunteered geographic information. So volunteers put the information there. Just like how Google Maps, Google Maps buys the data, volunteers put it there as well. But OpenStreetMap, we don't buy the data, we put it there ourselves, and it's for everybody. But for Google Maps, it's for G. You can't use it as a shape file. Have you ever tried before? No, I Good. Yeah, you have to do it yourself. But so you can go for the whole OpenStreetMap database and uh, use it as a shapefile database, whatever. And uh, because it's reusable, that's how come Facebook's map. Uh, when you check Facebook, the map you see there is 100% OpenStreetMap with some other things coming from Facebook itself. And Apple Maps also is OpenStreetMap for the road networks. Um, so it's for everybody. Just that when you use it, you state that it's from OpenStreetMap. Have I been able to answer your question? Thank you very much. Uh, okay, we'll take one more question before we call it a day. Okay. So, okay generally, you, you, you did not introduce yourself, so you, you can go. <laughs> uh, one of the slides, you showed, I think it was your quote. I didn't understand whether 
And the nearest is this. Yes, so for example, right. school is set point. Yeah. So I didn't understand. And then the next, the very next one. Which one? The, the next one after this. Uh, the next slide after this slide. Yes. This? OK. So I was wondering, is it that the place, that, uh, the University of Ghana, is already marked on the open street map? That, that's why we were able to use the name rather than sort of. Uh, because this is just a stream of University of Ghana. So I was wondering whether it was. You are right. University of Ghana is mapped on OpenStreetMap. So what basically that line is doing is using a, a geocoder called Normatin, which uh, OpenStreetMap uses. So Normatin, yeah, it's open source. And then um, it's searching for area points, anything that has the name University of Ghana within Accra, and it's in Ghana. You can see the comma is actually specifying it. So if, assuming I search for University of Ghana, if it's somewhere else, it will return um, a list of values. So just that and he did this just plotting a graph is really basic this you know and, and this one is based on the overpass api so overpass is just like um, the terminal to querying data in open street map at the base level the xml itself so um, it just defines amenity equals school so in open street map we call something map features here so that is how the whole community has agreed to map schools so when you go to UK, Togo, France, wherever you go, every school that is mapped has a physical tag. So this is University of Ghana. So you can see University of Ghana here is having the tags. We have key and then the value K equals this. So um, it's having amenity school. You can see for University of Ghana, it's amenity university. So that is how universities are tags. That's the physical tag. What is it on the ground? It's ATM. But it doesn't mean that all of them has the key amenity. It varies. So on the map features page, you see that. And then... It only search for that in Ghana. And this for points. So you can see node. The node there is a point. Yeah. So this so that's why I was saying that um, it could be that there are schools that are mapped as polygons. That is the person knew the boundary and traced it around and got it. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Nino. You're welcome. Thank you.